What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash, and today is August 9th of 2018. Well folks, today I want to spend a decent amount of time to talk about a piece of technology that I've not only been keeping my eye on over the past few months, but has really excited me in regards to its long-term potential as of recent. But before I dive into the specific technology, what it does, how it does it, and why it's so revolutionary, I want to spend some time to talk about a real-world application that's currently using this technology, and that is a website known as DTube. Now, don't let the looks fool you, DTube is not YouTube, however, both share a similar objective of sharing media contents, predominantly, in this case, video content. And if we go back clicking on any one of these videos here, we can see that as we click the play button, it instantly starts to load up and we can jump through the video, watch this content, in many cases we can watch from qualities of 360 to 480 to 720 to full 1080p, and it loads relatively fast. But the interesting thing about DTube, unlike YouTube, is that it doesn't require on a centralized company like Google to store the files on the platform. So as whereas you're, when you're watching a video on YouTube, for example, maybe this video you're watching right now, you require Google to store that file. But on DTube, that's not the case. It uses a distributed system of file sharing to access these files on a variety of different computers and uh, places that can actually store information. So how does this actually work? How is DTube, uh, really in this case, acting as the first decentralized form of video sharing? Well, it uses Steam as an incentive model here, and definitely I'd love to dive into DTube later on. I think it's a really awesome platform. But it really uses a revolutionary piece of technology known as IPFS, or the Interplanetary File System. Now we're gonna be talking about how IPFS works and how it's able to bring about distributed uh, file sharing systems that don't rely on central authoritators to manage that information. Again, like I was stating before, not only is you know Google a player in this, but when we go about using platforms like Facebook or Snapchat, these companies have massive warehouses that store this information. And there's some serious flaws that come with relying on those systems. So we're gonna be talking about the problems that come from the traditional system, and then dive into how IPFS can fix some of these issues. So. Let's go ahead here and take a look at the problem here. The problem can be really illustrated in a very simple diagram here. I tried to keep it as minimalistic as possible. But let's say, for example, that I'm on YouTube, for example, and I want to load a video file, an MP4 file in this case. Maybe it's a new daily update from the Data Dash channel, or maybe it's some kind of piece of content from uh, you know some other channel that I like to watch. Well, there's two issues that can arise from this traditional model of requesting a specific uh, location-based file on Google's store, uh, Google's database in this case. I need to go and request this file from Google, and it's gonna be in the form of a URL. There's two issues that could come from this. One, maybe for example, Google servers are down or they've stopped hosting the file in that case, whereas I won't be able to access that traditional file that was uploaded on there. And there might not be a record of it anywhere else on the internet, so I can't access it anymore. So that's one way uh, that things could go wrong. But another thing as well is that maybe they might be able to pick up that I'm trying to request a specific piece of content that they don't want me to see. Maybe they want to censor me out of being able to see a specific type of content. And in this case, it might be something maybe that Google disagrees with on a moral basis. Maybe they're worried uh, they don't want their advertisers to uh, be advertising over these pieces of content, et cetera. It could be a variety of different things. But there's two serious issues here. It gives a lot of central authority to a specific company, as well as a lot of centralized mistakes that can be made due to the fact that there might be technological logical issues. So because of this, we have to look for an alternative system. We had been for a quite, uh, quite some time, we've been looking for some kind of way where we can actually break past the monopolization of large corporations. And IPFS does this in a very, very unique way. So let's go ahead and dive into some of the main frameworks of IPFS. So as stated before, IPFS is the interplanetary file system. And how does it actually revolutionize uh, you know, data sharing in this case? How do we go about distributing it rather than having it in centralized systems? Well, what IPFS does is it, it changes the way that we store information. It goes from what's known as a location-based address to a content-based form of addressing. So to give you a very broken down explanation as to what that means, in regards to location-based addressing, I'm going about requesting something specifically stored in a specific location at Google's uh, servers. Uh, in that case, when I wanna go about actually accessing a specific piece of information, I need to go through their warehouse of information to actually get a specific file if I want to load this, for example, Data Dash video. Whereas on a content-based form of addressing, we address files with a unique identity. We see information 
in a hashed format in this case. Whereas if we want to access a specific file, we're not going to request, uh, for example, maybe nick.jpg. We're going to be looking for a specific, uh, specific unique identity in this case, which is going to be put out in the form of a hash. So well, let's go ahead and explain this a little bit better here. So we have this diagram here, for example, of a document, and we can see that we're going to actually hash the specific file. Now, why is hashing important here in regards to security? Well, we wanna make sure that in this distributed system, if we're trying to access a specific video or file, let's say, for example, this video, we wanna make sure we're getting the right one. And if you were to hash any file, uh, it's going to pre present a unique identity. And what makes it even more secure is that if I go about changing anything in that file, if I try to manipulate the video or the Word document, maybe I even move one single word or piece of text within that document. If I change anything about it, it is going to actually change the hash. So as when we go about storing these files on the network where one or a few nodes might have a copy of the hash as well as the actual file, if I go about requesting a specific file by its hash, maybe I want to see that uh, this same video, I don't want to see other pieces of content, I want to guarantee that I'm seeing this video from the Datadash channel. I can go about sending out a request for that specific hash. And I can also verify as well that I'm getting the right file in that case, because again, the file has the unique hash tied to it. It's like an identity and a fingerprint. It's a way of identity verification for information. So this is generally how IPFS works, and it allows us in a distributed manner to say, hey, who has the file on the network? I want to see this video of Nick talking about IPFS. And maybe one or two other nodes on the network, or maybe multiple nodes, might have a copy of that file and they can actually send it through. So this is a really cool way where we can actually store information on our computers, share it with one another, and we can be resistant to censorship and possibly even uh, losing, uh, losing uh, the file itself. But however, there are a few issues with IPFS right now. It's nothing, nothing's really perfect from the get-go. There are two key problems with IPFS. One, as of now, much like systems like torrenting, there's not really an incentive to actually uh, almost be a seeder for the file, to actually provide the file and store it in your computer. When you've accessed the file or downloaded it on your computer, it might be stored, but some users might remove it. And if enough users remove that file, it will be lost on the network. There won't be anyone who's kept a unique record of not only the actual document, but the actual unique hash. So when people request it, the document won't be there. So we've got lots of uh, concerns here in regards to the long-term potential of IPFS in regards to it actually being used for commercial applications. If we're talking tons and tons of data, not just early stage kind of experimentation as it is right now. If we talk about this becoming the framework for data for the web, we want to make sure we can access information. So there's a lot of people working with this. In fact, the people who built IPFS, Filecoin, the team at Filecoin, who's actually going about building a uh, decentralized market for file storage, is actually going about fixing some of these issues. They're trying to build an incentive model for those uh, not only to about use the uh, cryptocurrency that's tied with it to go about purchasing file storage, but along with that as well, people being able to earn for giving up some of their computational storage to other people on the network. So again, we can build economic incentive models for it, but we can see, for example, in the example that I brought up earlier, for example, torrenting, that in many cases, this system works quite well, even with the flaws that it has. So. Again, like I said with DTube, DTube is a perfect example. We can go about watching all types of video content, video content out of all things, which is probably the most demanding comparative to images or social media pages. In this case, we're actually being able to access video files in a distributed manner. And if we're able to do this so far, it shows that there's a pretty good track record of success so far. So I recommend that you guys keep on looking into it. If you find this exciting, explore DTube a little bit, learn about it, try it out for yourself. It's completely open. You can uh, register for an account. You can upload your own content on there. It's all free to do. It's a really, really fascinating system. And if you guys are a little bit of a tech junkie like myself, I recommend that you guys go through and read into the white paper and try to gather as much as you can from it. But there's a ton of great resources that I'll leave linked down below in the description that you can go through to get a better idea as to how IPFS works. It's a very, very fascinating system. And as someone like myself who's kind of avoidant of all the noise in this space, I'm really excited to see people use this technology and actually build some really cool systems about it, especially in a day and age 
where YouTube is getting caught censoring people. Uh, YouTube is not as uh, user friendly as it used to be and isn't really tailored towards building a free open platform for its users. That is where I think applications like DTube are going to come in and really give YouTube a run for its money. Anyways, I'd like to hear what you guys think about this down in the comments down below. What do you all think about IPFS? If you want to learn more about the technical side of it as well, I would love to dive a little bit deeper in explaining how IPFS works. But until the next video, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Stay tuned.